Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Failures to Fortunes podcast, the show where we fearlessly dive into the untold stories of real estate investors' greatest setbacks and how they turned those failures into resounding successes. I'm your host, Kate Berry, and we're talking with real estate investors across the country to learn exactly how and why they failed and how they took that failure and turned it into a powerful lesson for their business. So come along with me, Kate Berry, on this transformative journey from failure to fortune. I invite you to join our supportive community where together we can inspire, educate, and motivate each other to achieve all of our real estate investing goals. Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Failures to Fortunes podcast. I'm your host, Kate Berry. On this show, we dive deep into the journeys of real estate investors and agents who have experienced failures, but are willing to share the lessons learned that help them turn those failures into fortunes. We are thrilled to be here today with our guest, Eric Martell. Eric is the founder of Flip System. He's founded it together with his father, Antoine Martel. Martel. They started flipping houses together when Antoine was still in college. In a few short years, they built a turnkey rental company and flipped over 600 properties across the U.S., overseeing some $85 million in total real estate transactions. This experience led them to create Flip System, a one-stop shop where investors can find, fix, fund, sell, or rent properties. So Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. I just want to correct that. I'm the father. and uh, You're I'm... the father. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> You're the father. Okay. So Antoine is your son. Antoine is my son, yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's great. It's a family business. My wife is also involved in this, and I have my other son that's also involved in Flip System. So the, the whole family has been a family business, family endeavor. So Yes. You know, you see a lot of that in real estate, family-owned businesses, because, I mean, tell me why. I don't know why. I think it's pretty difficult. I don't know about the real estate, if it's something about the real estate in itself, but because there are different skill set that is needed Mm -hmm. uh, then, mm -hmm. you, you know, I have someone that likes the construction side of it and all that. Someone that's very good at sales. Another person that's like marketing. True. You know. That's a good point. Uh, yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you can find your little niche and stay with with the company. I like that. Might be a little <laughs> bit difficult in other industries. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, it could work within a family, but to anyone listening, you know, you may not think, oh, I can't be into real estate because I'm not good at, you know, maybe I'm not good at math or I don't know how to build a house. You All different kinds of skill sets can fit into real estate. Exactly. Yeah. Tell us how you got started in real estate. Well, for me, like I started very early at 18 years old, had my rich dad, poor dad moment. And my father was living paycheck to paycheck, my parents and, you know, working at an aluminum plant, really not understanding business or money, finance or bank or anything like that. But I met at college when I was 18 years old, I met someone that uh, was a real estate investor. Mm -hmm. And I basically begged him to mentor me. And he, the thing is that he was a regular person. He was a community college teacher. Uh, he wasn't teaching finance or entrepreneurship or anything in business. I hmm. think he was teaching geography or something like that. <laughs> Location, right? <laughs> uh, that's right. See? <laughs> Another skill set. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like, to me, I thought that I, I kind of had this, this idea that's like, well, it's really not about kind of education level, all that kind of stuff. You just have to be like smart. And there's a difference between being smart and being intelligent yes, and uh, you just have to be smart and understand how the business work. And that always fascinated me. And so, yeah, he coached me and I, with his support, I managed to build, not build, buy an eight unit apartment building yep. with no money down. And it was... Nice cash flowing. And then I got the bug at that point. I said, okay, well, I want to do more of that. Yeah. Uh, but to do find these kinds of deal, you need a lot of work and a lot of effort. And it really took me a long time after that. I was distracted by careers and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then I worked in the high tech industry. After working as an actuary, I went to high tech industry and did a lot of stock options in that during mm -hmm. those years with companies. And then I had the dot-com crash happen. I moved to California, dot-com crash happened, basically wiped me out. I still remember my financial advisor when I brought him my, all my stock options said, well, you're done. You can, you can retire now. You have uh, all the money you need. You just said, okay. And a few months later, stock market crash. 
<laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh. So for anyone listening that may not know what you're referring to, the dot com crash, can you tell us when that happened and a little short how that happened? Yeah, basically from 1990, I would say all the way to 2000, 2001, that's when the dot com crash happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies, high-tech companies, were very overvalued in the stock market. And mm -hmm. there was just like people that were losing money. There was just like companies were losing money. And then, but people would invest in these IPOs. They would mm -hmm. make a fortune on IPOs right. and the initial public offerings. So where the company would actually go to market. And yeah. it, was, it was insane. Everybody was involved in the stock market. I was, I had a contract with people in and, you know, visiting a lot of different businesses, different companies, and everybody was watching MSNBC, looking at the spark box and all that. And everybody was aware of the stock market. The receptionists were buying IPO, yeah. uh, you know, all these. Yeah, right. It was insane, insane. And then, uh, but then it ha came to a uh, realization, they kind of sober, everybody sobered up at the same time. Yeah. And that's when we got the headache of the dot-com crash. And for the stock options, the issue with the stock option is that you have a break point where, you know, as long as the price is above that strike point, that strike mm -hmm. price, mm -hmm. you're making money. But mm -hmm. if it goes below that strike price, then you're not making it. It's yeah. worth zero. Right. So, so even though I had a very low strike price, that strike price went just almost like at oh. that. And then wow. Was so when that happened, did you still have the eight unit? property no, I, have sold, I have sold that prior to that prior to moving to california gotcha. did you have any real estate in your portfolio at that time no at that point no because then i was really focused on you know starting a consulting business and mm -hmm. interested in high tech and yeah so that's kind of what i was focused on when i moved to california then after the dot-com crash that really changed my whole focus i said sure. I want to be in control of my investment. And if that thing is going to, if my investment is going to tank, at least it's going to be my fault. Right. So, <laughs> That's right. You so, know, I mean, you can tell me if this is true or not, but that might be maybe the most devastating part of all that is to have your money disappear basically overnight, not based on anything that you did or have control over. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You just, it was just like a complete exuberance from the, the stock market. People, overvaluing thing it's great on the way up everybody's having fun but on the other side it's not very pleasant wow uh, so, so yeah. how did, tell me uh, walk us through that a little bit you know how did you go from losing everything and how did you get through that and and what was kind of your next steps so next step is really meditate <laughs> <laughs> pray <laughs> but you really have to think yeah you have to think about it i mean there's nothing you can do about it so it's in the past. It's in the past. There's no point in dwelling about it right. to say you can think about it a little bit and say, what could I have done differently? And sure. all of that. is there anything, is there any lessons learned from that? And, you know, it depends like when something is like that, like the stock market, that's really out of your control. You could say, well, I could have cashed everything in uh, beforehand. And I did, did some diversification, yep. but the whole market crashed. Right. So then I said, well, I should have diversified into a different asset class. So right. stock market, I should, if I had some real estate, if I had maybe gold or something like that, right. then I balanced yep. out. So that's kind of my lessons learned from that is I want to be in a different asset class or mm -hmm. multiple asset yep. class. I want to be able in control of my investment. Mm -hmm. right? This I don't want to be like blindsided. The yep. stock market is really... So it's glorified gambling in many cases. What's happening with the stock market is slightly disconnected from what's happening in the economy. And right. it's connected from what's happening in the business. Also, sometimes you have right. companies that and it was true of the stock market. These companies were losing money and they were still the value of the business was going up and up. Right. And connected with what's going on. I mean, you can look around uh, for the businesses yeah. that uh, part I of love that. I love what you said about the stock market is not always a reflective or in line with the economy. And that's so true. I think that can be something that is a misconception a little bit. You hear about the stock market, you're like you're equating that to the whole economy. But yeah. there are right. thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of businesses that are not in the stock market okay. that uh, yeah. contribute to our economy. Exactly. And also the business, like even the business making money or losing money doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's really reflected in the value in many ways. Right. And that's, that's where it gets tricky, right? Yeah, exactly. So, 
and you trust a lot of people trust the analysts but the analysts really they're just a marketing marketing mm -hmm. rep for these stocks they're analyzing deals and then really and it was really obvious in the dot-com crash prior to the dot-com crash all the overhype of these stocks they were just pumping these these stocks that really yeah it was probably it was actually really a marketing pr kind of exactly <laughs> plot tactic well, Exactly. So that's kind of what the, you reflect on these mistakes and say, well, what could I have done differently? And that's what I came up with. That's and uh, that's where my focus became like investing in things that are, that I had more control. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted something that was more, I had more like freedom. So a freedom mm. movement, being able to work sure. and make money in the world, yeah. being able to travel and all that kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, and I was a consultant. I had been a consultant for many years. Mm -hmm. I wanted to disconnect my revenue from my time. So mm. when you're a consultant, every minute counts. So right. you know, every minute you're not working, that's a minute you're not being billed. So I wanted to disconnect that. I wanted money to be able to income to grow without mm -hmm. me having to spend necessarily more time. And this yeah, is what not started. trading time for dollars, not exactly. trading because time is it. Uh, it does. You can't, how can you put a value on it, really? And if there's ways that you can do it to be in control of your time, it's not that you don't work, right? You're not just sitting on a beach all day, like just watching money come in. But sometimes that's how it's sold. What financial freedom is, right? But so tell me, what was the first business you did? You stay in consulting, or did you go into another avenue? So I did consulting, continued consulting, and then tried to hire a consultant to work uh, with me. Then we did mm -hmm. more software development, so mm -hmm. building applications and software. But we also did something, I'm passionate about food, so my wife and I also did a, a low-carb grocery store. She wasn't really involved in the low-carb at that point. We did a gourmet sauce company after doing cool. private chef business and all that kind of stuff. So... Yeah. And then, so we worked in those business and the plan was that they would eventually kind of grow, would mm -hmm. hire a manager and yep. then that would take care of itself. And then we'd have passive yep. income and then the business would, would manage itself. So that was the plan, like every good plan. It, you know, it were, I mean, it was not a failure. These businesses were not failures, but they were not taking us to our goal. So when we were looking at how's the business tracking, how fast it's growing, how do we scale the business? It mm -hmm. was, it was hard to scale and yeah. it was, it was also limiting. Like when you have a gourmet sauce, uh, yes. sauce company and you want to grow to a certain volume and you have to find more stores, yes, more distributors, market. manufacturing, yeah. the so scale level is, I mean, there's, I feel like there's only one asset class or business that is more difficult than real estate and it's restaurants and food. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. It's, and then, yeah, restaurant and food is also, I mean, we did talk about doing that as well, but then you're restricted also by the location. Yes. Then. So it's very hard to scale this. You can open multiple locations, but then it's going to cost you $200,000, yeah. $500,000 yes. to open. It's a grind. One. It is a massive grind. And yes. uh, that's why you see some people, you know, in that business for their whole lives or in a in single restaurant or single food business at their whole lives. And, you know, right now we work in real estate where we are, but we also do business brokerages and we're seeing a lot of these food companies, you know, trying to retire yeah. and they really can't, you know, because they've just had that one business. And so yeah. we're kind of talking again, back about the diversification. So, you know, you had a couple of these businesses and food, you said they weren't doing what you needed to do. So how did you deal with that? So this is the, the thing is that, yeah, we have a goal in mind and we had mm -hmm. kind of, this is what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. And so we tried the, the different strategies and said, well, this strategy is not getting me there. So that we basically shut down the business mm -hmm. businesses and then focused on other businesses that we can do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we started doing real estate. So one of my younger son came to me and said, you wanted to be a real estate investor. And I said, all right. <laughs> I had tried to do that. I was in the San Francisco Bay Area. When I had all these stock options, I was trying to find like apartment buildings. I was yep. trying to flips. I was trying to do, yeah, apartment buildings that cash flowed. It was yep. possible to find. Oh, man. Unless you put a ton of money into it. But and then you had a really good deal your first time too, right? No money down, cash flowing immediately, eight yeah, units. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> it took a lot of effort to get that deal though. Yeah, I I'm sure. Like 500 deals in order to get that one wow. deal out yeah but yeah so I, now i had a ton of money but then i couldn't find the deal so one time you have mm -hmm. no money you can find the deal yep of uh, course of <laughs> and no deal that, that you have the real estate irony 
Yeah. And unless you put a lot of cash, you know, a lot of down payment to reduce your mortgage payment, then yeah. it would break even. And then you would put like, you know, so some of the deal that I was looking at, it was like, it was like five or $6 million for like seven unit in San Francisco. And wow. it would cash flow only if I put in like $2.5 million cash in the business, then it would break even. Uh, it was like, well, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. How can you think? That's why I said, well, I'm, at that point, I said, well, I'm just going to leave my money in the stock market. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened. And so <laughs> now we were kind of looking at it again. So we said, okay, well, maybe it's not these apartment buildings. Maybe we were looking at it differently. We attended some some conferences, webinars, meetups. Mm -hmm. We spent yeah. money on programs, education programs to figure yeah. out like what was going on. And then, so we tried different things. We tried like wholesaling. We tried probate. We tried all the things to find distressed properties that are yeah. off market in the Bay Area. And said, well, we're going to renovate them and stuff like that. And it yeah. didn't make sense. Everybody knows the value of their, or know the value of their house after a renovation. So they want to sell it to you at that price, but before right. you renovate. Right. It's the opportunity. <laughs> so you don't understand. It's like, I'm not paying for the renovation, you know? So not you. But what it could uh, be. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah, I get so, that yeah, a lot. So we had a couple of people like that. We tried to get the deal. It didn't really make sense. And you had other issues in, in terms of operation as well. So, And the thing that really broke the... The, the camel's back was one deal that we're plan, planning to do. It was on the market for $750,000. And we thought it would be, we were invited. We, we thought it was a special invite from the broker to walk the property and say, okay, yeah, let's go there. And then yeah. we were met with a hundred other people. It was like an open house. <laughs> with a, basically an open house. <laughs> yeah, it's a special deal for you. And so I'm like, okay. Oh, real? Yes. Nice. And then, as a result, I'm not, then I didn't feel that special. Nope. So go there and then a hundred people there. We look at the, the amount of work that needs to be done. We thought another $500,000 would do it. It was really a gut job. Yeah. Mold, there was a hole in the roof. Yeah. Uh, wow. Mold everywhere. Different types of molds as well. Black wow. mold, red molds. All oh my of gosh. <laughs> that, um, it, the structure was nice. So we thought, okay, well, there's, there's potential here. It was a nice neighborhood. Yep. We can sell this house for like, I think it was like $2.2 million. Yeah, around $2 million. Yep. yep, right. So that's a pretty good spread. That's a good yeah. flip. Mm -hmm. It sounds like. But of course, I said, well, this is... Uh, then I asked the broker, I said, well, how much interest do you have in the property? How many people uh, asked for the disclosure package? Yep. There's like 35 people. I said, okay, so we have to be pretty competitive. Yeah. Right? So I look at my, all my numbers, all that kind of stuff, and I make an offer for $1.2 million. Uh, no, no contingency. Yep. You know, because that's, you want to, you want the house or not. Mm -hmm. so. Right. <laughs> so, and basically it's, it's sold for 1.4. So I was number four on the list of uh, people accepted it. Then I knew that I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong market. Right something wrong here like you know i have resources i have people i have contractors and sure. maybe yeah at the 1.4 price like you said so we can break it down a little bit right so 1.4 you said it needs about 500,000 in repairs oh. so that's bringing you up to 1.9 1 1 you said the after repair was maybe 2.2 yeah maybe 2.2 at the max but maybe somewhere between 2 2 million and 2.2 million dollars but then i have the holding costs Right. For that period, I have the permitting. This is San Francisco, so it's not obvious. And yeah. then have, so I'm gonna put all this money in to make a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe if you're if it all goes well. Well, exactly. So right. didn't make a lot of sense. So no. if you look at your cash on cash return, it was less than one percent. Yeah. So I said, well, again, might as well leave the money in the stock market. Right. So that's kind of where that's we said, okay, well, this, this doesn't work. I said, maybe commercial would work. So we mm -hmm. tried to do commercial. We had a house under, not a house, a property under contract in San Francisco. And again, we had like, I think that I put the offer, the letter of intent was for like $15 million. And we thought that we could sell it with the, the plan that we had mm -hmm. to sell it for like $45 million. Yep. And basically it was multi, when you have like commercial at the bottom and then you have residential. Yeah, uh, multi-use. Multi-use, yeah. And then building a, a underground garage, all yep. that. Nice. That. Yeah. We had a somebody for the money, 
And then basically he said, okay, he was just there. I said, oh yeah, we'll give you the money. We'll give you the money. So we kept moving forward, putting sure. more money for the inspection, for the architect, for this, for that. And said, well, okay, when are you going to give us the money? Okay, well, I need more. I want to make sure, like, I'm going to give you the money once. Eventually he said, once it's the, you have a ready to issue permit. Well, that's going to take two years to get a ready to issue permit. And that doesn't make any sense. Money, right. Yeah, and money, exactly. So we have to back out of that deal and we lost. We got our EMD. Oh, we lost yeah. We lost some money in terms of the paying the architect, paying. The, yeah, it's not cheap. Yeah. So, yeah, again, another kind of uh, situation where I say, well, this is not the right market. I'm in, the, I'm right. way over my head here. Yep. I'm all fish in a big pond and I'm somewhere else. It's not working, right? Don't keep trying to force something that's not working. And I think that goes back to, you were talking about your other businesses. They weren't doing what they needed you to do. To do. You, they weren't getting you to the goals that you wanted to do. So you've got to pivot. You've got to look around and say, this isn't working. Let's try something new. Exactly. So then we went back to the drawing board and said, well, Achieve financial go financial freedom is what I want. I want to, you know, so I need cash flowing rental properties. That's what I need. So I want something that's super simple, something that I don't you need a huge amount of, of money to get started. Yep. yep. You know, that's going to be cash flowing from day one or shortly after I rehab, if I buy yes. this. No rest. crazy carrying cost, right. carrying timeline. Yep. I want to be the big fish for once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to find the right size pond. Find it right, exactly. So, um, then we said, okay, well, wait. So we should look outside the San Francisco, the California market. So which market would that be? We want to have landlord friendly states. We want to have, you know, so we came up with a bunch of criteria. And me being an actuary, I downloaded a whole bunch of data from uh, Census Bureau and Bureau of Labor Statistics and mashed them all up yep. and said, okay, well, we're going to look at Memphis, Cleveland, St. Louis. And these are the markets that we looked at. Great. But our first property in Memphis. Yep. I think we paid like $45,000 for it. We put $5,000 in renovation. And then the after repair value was, I think like $70,000. Nice. We refinanced yep. it. We got yeah. more money than what we put in. So I think we had put like fifty thousand dollars in stuff, and, yep. and yep. then we got like fifty six or fifty seven thousand dollars out of that. Yep. And so I had more, five thousand dollars more in my pocket. I had a house that was cash flowing. Yes, you could do another deal, and you I could do another, do another one. I said, okay, well, I want two more deals like that. Yes, <laughs> so, let's do this uh, point. <laughs> obviously, that doesn't happen very often that you find a unicorn, especially on the first project. But so I was lucky enough, and that was it. I said, okay, this is what we got to do. Yes. And uh, at the beginning, it was just doing our family portfolio. And uh, as we grew the portfolio, I mean, we had done all kinds of businesses, as I mentioned before. And then our friends were asking us, like, what are you guys doing now? Right. Like, well, we're investing in single family rentals out of state in Memphis. Yeah. So what? It's, what where's, that, how's, where's that coming from? Right. Like, <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> Memphis. Like, why Memphis? Yeah, well, we we're also doing Cleveland. Cleveland? Yeah. Like, so we, it, they thought I was crazy. And then and so I kind of explained a little bit. And after a while, now they came back and they said, well, are you selling the properties when you're done? Like, I would be interested in maybe buying it once you've done all the renovations and all because they're just looking for the cash flow and some place yeah. to put their cash into an asset, but they don't necessarily want to do all that renovation. They also aren't going to have the systems in place or know how to execute something like that, but they want the return, right? Exactly. And the team on the ground too. That's another big component. Yeah. Because obviously we're doing it remotely. I'm not living in Memphis or Cleveland. So right. I have the team on the ground, I had to, we have to vet the team. Yeah. The yeah. Right. One property at a time, you know? And now we had a team, we had the realtor, we had the contractor, we had the property management company. Nice. Exactly which neighborhood to buy. And then we yep. just, just cranked it up. It, I don't and, think you were that just lucky then in getting these deals. That's a lot of work lucky. to set up. But the unicorn was a little bit lucky. Finding sure. the, you know, yeah, that was, we think a lot about, about these things. I didn't find the right market building the team, finding the right realtor and stuff like that. There's a lot of effort into a that. A lot of effort. I think people really minimize the amount of effort and skill that it takes to put that team together. Because if you have one week link, like you said, there's all these different aspects to real estate. It's construction, it's the marketing, 
it's the financials, you know, it's the business management. Like these are all different skill sets. That's why you do have to have a team. But if that one, if, if the one part construction is falling apart, the whole deal is at risk. Yeah, exactly. And it, uh, the worst part, because then you start construction already. I'd rather know upfront that you're going to overcharge me. So I don't go into the deal in the first place. Uh, so <laughs> probably do, probably do inspection. Wouldn't and, that be nice? <laughs> uh, exactly, right? So... And then right. the contractor that we had, we he also did, uh, it was a firm bid. So like he would walk the property with the inspection, with the inspection, yep. kind of look at everything that was done. And so if it was a little bit over, he wouldn't charge us extra because we were doing multiple deals. Right. So he knew that there would be like two or three more deals coming. So he says, okay, I'm losing a thousand dollars here. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to. Yep. Nice. Right. So, right. Yeah, so course, you did the you did a couple of deals and tell how did we get to where we are today? You know, with with yeah. flip system it sounds. I mean, you got systems, you're doing flips. I kind of see where it's going. Yeah, and then so with Martel Turnkey, so we grew the company over the years, and then we did over like 650 of these flips. We also started a wholesaling company called Rocket Offer. We did about 250 wholesale deals there. Nice. We did some apartment buildings as well. And, and then it was just like a lot of people were asking us, well, so I want to do the, what you guys are doing. And so, okay, well, we'll show you how that's done. So we created an online program to do that and say, I wrote a book also, Stop Trading Your Time for Money, where I lay out exactly what you need to do. It's right. on Amazon. And, I got to get uh, that. I got to get that because that so, it's so important. Yeah. And then, so in my book, I talk about the mindset. That's a big thing. Then it's about what you need to know, what skills you need. And then it's that after that, the third section is really about the process. Okay, well, nice. you need to build a team. So you need to, yep. once you identify the market, you need to find the team. You need to talk to a bunch of people. 95% of the realtors are not going to respond to you or they're going to respond to you after two or three weeks. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to work with those people. Right. The other yeah. one, the other people that respond, they don't understand working with real estate uh, investors. So, you know, you eliminate those. Then you want to make sure they're aligned with your goals, all that kind yep. of stuff. And after all these calls, I mean, we found one person in Memphis, one person, two people in Cleveland, wow. and then a couple of people and uh, one person in St. Louis. And then a couple of, now we have That's more. a great lesson there, right? And also just, yeah, not all realtors are created equal or yeah. and not a, in any profession, you know, and. Not interested. Some of them are not interested in working with. Yeah. It's not their, it's not their niche and that's okay. Everyone can have their specialty and most, you know, most realtors are going to be in that residential single family, helping people buy and sell their own personal homes and yeah. real estate investing is a, a whole different beast. Yeah. And so you want someone specialized in that investment niche. You don't want a residential agent that does a, a you know commercial occasionally on the side. They yeah. have to be all aligned in that world because that's who their network is going to be. That's what their resources are going to be. Their own systems are going to integrate into your systems and you both have the same goals too, right? Because they want to yeah, exactly. help you buy and sell as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And goes same goes with property management companies. You have mm -hmm. property management companies. They just want to do these large apartment buildings. Yeah. Right. They're not interested in having some guy run around in a truck across different houses all over the city. They don't, they don't want that. They want to have right. one person that goes one truck, one place. And every then single day, work. same thing over and over. And that's and again, yeah, that is totally fine. But I think for some of us and probably a lot of people listening that are investors or entrepreneurs, we're just not that tight to yeah. do the same thing every day. <laughs> but this is what I like about single family rental is that this is you can really get into a groove about if you look at the houses that we have for uh, the houses yeah. that we have in Martel Turnkey website. You're going to see that there's a, they are very similar from one another. It's really yeah. like cookie cutter. And that's the advantage of these single family rentals is that, you know, I don't have to tell my contractor what kind of countertop to put, what to paint the wall, yeah. whether he should change the cupboard, what he should change the cupboards for. And uh, he knows already yeah. because he's done it like 500 times before, 300 times before. So there's no discussion about what the scope of work is. He walks the yeah. property. He knows exactly what he needs to do. Nice. That's Brilliant. the advantage of that. Brilliant. Uh, as opposed to these, the retail flips, it's a little bit more complicated. It's more like design and stuff like that. Oh, should we tear this wall down? Should we do this? Should we yeah. improve the layout? I don't improve the layout on anything. Uh, 
Like, oh yeah, right. If just buy right, <laughs> don't buy something where you need to do the whole lay layout over. That's right. So that's good advice. Get or exactly. Yeah. So a lot of people were interested in doing that. And so well, we tried to do the online training program. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that even if we tell people that this that's what you need to do, you just need to phone a hundred realtors and then talk to them. We give them the script on what to do. And people didn't have time to do it. They were not motivated enough to do it. They yes. just didn't do it. But then we said, okay, but because I had a mentor when I got started, when I was 18 years old, I said, well, that really worked for me. Like I have a mentor, a coach. So we started a mentorship yeah. program. And right. then same thing. We were charging a lot of money for people to join the mentorship program. And then they were not successful either. I was like, what's going on here? Like they, they didn't have the motivation. They, yeah was too much work for for people to to get involved and and get it done and it's like wow this is like and how we measure success is it's not by how much money we're making it's by how successful everybody is our customer absolutely right so we didn't like the fact that 95 percent of our the met the people that joined the mentorship program they didn't complete one transaction so we yeah. just like okay, we, we have to stop this this is nonsense yeah. right and this is what how flip system was born so we help you know, we, we have the online training program, we have the coaching, but we help you find the deal. So we have our acquisitions team is going to find the deals, put it in the software, the, the yep. portal that we have for our clients. Mm -hmm. Then you have a tool to analyze these deals. You basically put them in your analysis tool. This is all part of the same portal. Nice. Then you connect with your team on the ground. We connect you with the team on the ground and we cool. say, oh, yeah, you're interested in the Detroit market. You're in just yep. interested in the St. Louis market. Here are two or three realtors, property managers in that area. Call them. I mean, we've worked with them before. Call them and yeah. let them know that we're, we sent you. See if you want to work with them. And then it, you can connect them with the, the software platform as well, the, yeah. the portal with them. So you have a property. You say, I really like this property. You can mm -hmm. send it to your realtor and they, they see the property. They send the feedback back right right within the portal. Wow, that's so, so cool. Yeah, yeah. So that really saves a lot of step steps. And then, then you can put the offer with the realtor and then you get started with your deal. We help you, the coaches help you analyze deals. They help you with the acquisition. Like sometimes people have trouble acquiring properties. Sure, yes, yeah. With the strategy. Then there's also, we have someone that was reviewing and managing all the, our contractors. Yep. We would do review the inspection report, construction report, the scope of work and all that kind of stuff. So we have someone, a coach that uh, specializes in that as nice. well. And Great. That access. So with all of these things, and then we also, if you complete the program and you have a house, we connect you with everybody else, the lenders, if you right. want to sell the property. Yep. So you can do that refinance and start it all over again. Exactly. So we help you with all of that. We have great connection, great network, and then we have a community so you can communicate with, with other clients, other people that are That's so great. And it sounds like such a great resource for anyone that is really ready to get started into real estate. Maybe they have some money, but they don't know how to get started. And, and truthfully, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we, you know, started the interview. It's a difficult market to break into right yeah. now. I think more than ever before, you've got record high pricing, inflation, we've got interest rates that are, we've just came down a little bit, or at least, you know, the Fed lowered it a little bit, it might hopefully it'll affect mortgage rates, but also extremely low inventory. That's really, I think the biggest yeah. hurdle for a lot of new investors coming in, just so small inventory. And then, yeah, you get those bidding up wars. If you get anything priced right, and now your numbers don't make any sense. So it sounds great for someone who's ready to get started, maybe doesn't know necessarily or have the systems in place or know where to invest mm -hmm. and they can go through your system. Yeah, absolutely. And we basically switched this around now so that 95%, 97% of our clients are successful. They're nice. able to do a deal and complete. That's great. Oh, that's a great, Eric. That's such a that's such a cool thing to develop, and I think so useful for folks, especially now. Let, let's talk about now the market and what do you see coming next for you, but also the real estate market. So for us, again, we're in the Midwest, so there's uh, a lot of the markets is uh, St. Louis, Cleveland, mm -hmm. Detroit, uh, a lot of places in Ohio as well. So yep. 
we have Pittsburgh and all that. So lots of the, these these are great places that we have. We involve a lot in the workforce housing. So people that have jobs that have they're looking for a place to live. Yep. We also have the to me like the millennials are also moving out their family formation. So they're moving out if they were in apartment buildings. Yes. They're moving out and they're finding a single. We want their, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So that makes a big, make big difference for me. I, I see a lot of demand for the rental, for the tenants, for single family rentals. And you're right. There is a big market. The market is tight, but there are still opportunities out there. I mean, right. we're analyzing, you know, hundreds of deals a week. So there's no, we can find deals and our acquisition team is basically narrowing it down to maybe you know, 20 deals, 10, 20 deals a day in one particular wow. market, sometimes yep. more in bigger markets like Detroit, we have more deals there. Nice. But so yeah, but again, it's very competitive. So that means you, the speed to market is very important. And this is why our flip system portal is so important because mm -hmm. you can literally look at it, take the property, click on the button, it puts it in your tool, you can add your financing, you can talk to your realtor and adjust the after repair value, you can adjust mm -hmm. the repairs, see if the numbers still make sense. It calculates kind of the your returns on the different flips. If you're going to do a flip, if you're going to do a burr, what is the return going to be for the person that's going to buy your rental yep. flip? So all these things. So you, re, you have all the metrics already calculated and nice. you can make a decision very quickly. Right. This is what's yeah. important is to be able to, as soon as the property gets on the market, our acquisitions team, within two hours, they've analyzed the deal and they put it on the property marketplace. That's and brilliant. You look at it, you boom, you push the, pull the trigger and uh, you, you can be the first one to make an offer. I love that. Fast, simple, easy, direct, analytical, you know, you're running the numbers and you've got the consultation and the coaching and the mentorship part of it as well. So Eric, I really enjoyed our interview today. I can't wait to check out flip system. I'm going to go into it now, find my next flip and, you know, live that financially free life. Absolutely. <laughs> and for this will be in the show notes, but for anyone listening, what is the best way for people to reach out to you? Reach out to me on social media, Eric Martel official. So I'm pretty much everywhere. LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok now. And nice. uh, also you can't, Get away with from TikTok. And, yes, no, uh, just embrace it. Yeah, <laughs> the millennials love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't mind it. That's and then I have, I'm on YouTube as well, Eric Martel official. So I have a channel there. A lot of the stuff that I talk about financial freedom, helping people make money, financial education. So I talk about a lot of these topics on my YouTube channel. So that's the best way to reach out to me, and also flipsystem.com. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you again for being on our show and thank you to all our listeners. This is the Failures to Fortunes podcast and I'm your host, Kate Berry. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Real Estate Investing Failures to Fortunes podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and insights, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback means the world to us. Remember, your journey in real estate is a marathon, not a sprint. Embrace the failures, learn from them, and turn them into your stepping stones to success. I'm Kate Berry, and until next time, keep hustling, stay inspired, and keep turning those failures into fortunes. Happy investing.